So welcome to episode four. Uh, we've touched upon a lot about what blockchains are, and we also made mentions of different consensus models in the last lesson. So in this time, we'll go a little bit deeper into how each of the consensus models that are tied to the popular blockchains that we last discussed, how they work, their functions, and the benefits as well. So let's get into it. So what is consensus? When we, when we say consensus, what does that actually mean? The first thing we can kind of agree on is like a blockchain is a global state, right? There's some sort of someone's paid someone this, uh, someone paid someone that. There's sets of transactions and it, it manages the state of who owes what, what's the state of the accounts or wallets, and how much someone can actually pay if they want to pay someone else something else. So the blockchain kind of manages all of that. So for each transaction, the state changes, right? Something, the amounts change, uh, transactions are moved around, but there's also things that are committed to the blockchain. So let's say uh, in Ethereum, there's smart contracts that are deployed. So every time there's something new, the state changes and it needs to be managed. And every node must agree on the current state. So again, if the blockchain is replicated in each node, uh, they can't have a node that disagrees or has a different data because then the blocks become invalid. So how do we do that? That's actually through the consensus mechanisms that we'll talk about. It's actually answering the question of which node gets the state to actually change the state or validate that the transactions are within the blocks are incorrect or correct and that they can move on and be committed to a block and the next block can be uh, de developed. So there's different ways of doing that. So the first one we'll talk about is proof of work. So for, this was first used by Bitcoin. Like we discussed earlier, this is the first blockchain that was deployed. And it, it, instead of having um, what we call nodes, they're actually called miners. So these are the ones that actually are responsible for uh, validating the transactions. And the reason we call them miners is because they are performing some sort of compute within there, which is the proof of work part or the work part of the proof of work. So miners actually solve a cryptographic problem. So in this case, when we're taking the hash function, we're basically trying to get as the problem a, cer a certain number of zeros in the hash function. And we'll show you what that looks like as well. But basically taking the hash from the last block, can, putting the block of transactions, so the data that's in the block, and the nonce value of them, or not a number that's used only once, we need to get and solve that number of zeros so that whoever actually solves that problem by altering the nonce value is the one that actually gets rewarded. So the whoever first, the first miner is there, we, this is the minor rewards that uh, they get for validating the transactions. So let's look at what that looks like in, in real time. First, we have the hash of the last block, the block of transactions, and the nonce being one. This, we're also using the has uh, function, which this in case is the SHA-256. And we can see here, we have three zeros uh, as the beginning of our hash function. And this is incorrect. This is not actually solving the problem. But let's say as the next miner comes in and it changes the nonce to two. Now we see that the hash function has multiple zeros. So this is actually a valid block, or this is what the miner would be rewarded to. And this is the proof of work. Again, since it takes some compute power, the disadvantage here is if you have more compute power or more energy to use, you're able to solve this problem quicker than other miners. So there's some disparity as well as energy dispense. So that's why we needed to have a new consensus mechanism that's a bit more fair and a bit more environmentally friendly. And that's where proof of stake comes in. So it's a lower cost and it's more sustainable. Proof of work, you, no matter where you see it's being quoted as, a mechanism that you know takes in a, a, the same amount of power than a small country. So proof of stake changes that. How so? Well, in, in Ethereum 2.0, or otherwise known as the merge, validators, instead of doing some put a, performing a cryptographic problem or performing compute, they actually stake or offer the coins. So in the case of Ethereum, the minimum to become a validator is 32 ETH. And I won't quote exactly what that is, uh, because that, that value in dollars uh, changes throughout. Uh, but know that this is a, sort of a significant amount uh, for someone to become a validator. And validators then become randomly selected. So instead of 
becoming the first miner to p solve the cryptographic problem, a validator is randomly selected. And based on the stake of what, how they have st amount of coins or ETH that they have staked, the higher the chances are of them being coming the validator or the one responsible for validating the transactions for the current uh, bl bl block. You can actually have multiple validators per block, uh, which is quite different to proof of work. And the way we sort of provide trust into the system and the mechanism is if a validator uh, p it commits a fraudulent transaction or a wrong transaction, the validator actually loses the, the stake that they have placed. So if the minimum is 32 ETH, they might lose minimum uh, the 32 ETH, or if they've even staked more, uh, they will also lose that. So again, they put some trust and performance uh, guarantees that the validators have incentives to not include fraudulent, fraudulent transactions. The next mechanism that we'll look at is proof of history, and this is used by the Solana network. This is when speed is the top priority. Again, Solana is one of the higher performing blockchains out there, and speed in the case is of providing transactions per second is a guarantee there. So basically what it does is it allows us to use, understand that events should operate in certain sequences. And it uses this concept called verifiable delayed functions or VDF. Essentially these are functions that once a certain performance of steps occur, uh, they will be solved. So each node then has a, a sort of a crypto clock that embeds a time a timestamp that knows exactly when um, these steps should be taking place. So each block has uh, not only the hash of that, but also a count, which is kind of tied to the time that is verified uh, for the validation to occur for each node. And in the fact that each node uses this internal clock to validate uh, the transactions, there's actually no need to broadcast the network. And that's one of the core differences between that and proof of stake or proof of work, where each time a node validates uh, the transactions, it gets needs to get broadcasted, and then the nodes incorporate that into their uh, their ledger or their internal blockchain. So in this case, this is where things speed up, more or less, makes it more lightweight, uh, where there's no need to replicate or have every block do that when they all use the process internally. Now, I'm sure you're asking, just like the last video, which is the best? And we'll probably answer that question next time.